everybody. Welcome. Uh, yeah. My name is Lev, and Dimitri asked me to say a few words before uh, he presents the book to you. Uh, I want to talk about the man, the creator. You know, I've known Dimitri now for what? Six years? Yeah, we first met in Moscow. You know, it was December, it was really cold. Uh, you know, I, I was really confused when I first saw him. You know, he was the first American I saw in my life. And, uh, you know, I immediately felt this creative energy coming out of him. Three years ago, when I moved to New York, we, uh, you know, we started hanging out and I got to know this person really, really, really well and very close. And, uh, well, you know, I'm, I'm studying at an art school, so I meet a lot of people every day who are saying, yeah, you know, I'm working on a musical album, or, you know, I work on a script, or I, uh, I'm doing a book. But they, they never have anything to show for it, and uh, I was really shocked when in uh, April 2014 I was hanging out with Dimitri and he said, Yeah, you know, I, uh, you know, I created a book, the first draft, uh, I recorded an album, I moved house, and if that was not enough, I made a baby! <laughs> so, uh, you know, I think Dimitri is a great example, well, for me personally, and I think to all of us, as how much can a person create? He's not doing it for money, he's not doing it for fame, but he's doing it for himself, he does it for his muse, and I think that that is so rare nowadays. So, without further ado, I want to introduce my inspiration, my, uh, my hero, and my dear friend, Dimitri Wilde. Thank you guys for being here. Holy shit. Wow. Um, you did it. I did it, you know. This is seven years of my life, you know. I was working in this in trains when I was going to work. I was working on this anytime I got a free evening. Anytime I could put in the word or fix something. Editors, dealing with editors, like everybody has their own opinion. Who's right? Who's wrong? I don't know. But I guess you trust this. And uh, I want to talk about why did I write this book, or... It's because I was telling the same story to so many people. I telling this girl at work, I telling to my wife, I telling this guy, that guy, and they're like, Dude, it's great fucking stories! You gotta write them down! And I'm like, you know, I feel so heavy carrying them, I should write them down. So I sit down, it's supposed to be a little word document. It's like 240 pages. And uh, what's the book about? It's about, really it's about growing up. It's about a journey. It's about immigrants. It's about America. It's about being wild and finding yourself and finally finding your lost soul. And the uh, next question is, did this really happen? Well, it says right here, based on the true story, so... <laughs> How much of it happened, I'm not telling you. Which part is actually true, which is not. It's up to you to feel and find out, but it doesn't matter. I wanted the poetry to be here, the, the, the writing, the whatever is coming out to be there, so... Um, the names, I changed some names, because what people did was just too radical. <laughs> but I kept some just to make it more real. Anyways, I'm gonna start. Um, I have this amazing accordion player, Yuri Levinshev from Google Bordell, who's gonna assist me in this Yay. strange kind of little cabaret show I put together. Hey, you in here, Vinny? My parents immigrated to the United States from Moscow in 1993, a few years after the famous political coup of 91. Though my mom and dad always loved Russia and stood at the front lines against the tanks fighting for democracy, the corruption and mafia killed all opportunity for being an honest businessman. People were dying mysteriously, and everyone's life had a price. Everyone was entrepreneur dabbling in anything they could get their hands on. My father was trying to work as a middleman, connecting buyers with sellers. When there was not much to eat and selection of the stores was slim, sugar suddenly became a high commodity. During one of my father's biggest transactions, the Mafia brought him a suitcase full of American dollars in exchange for 50 trucks loaded with sugar. When the sugar supplier suddenly disappeared, the Mafia told him they were going to come after his family. The plan to immigrate to the United States materialized rather quickly. 
My parents are honest intellectual people who love their family and their vibrant friends. Almost everyone graduated from college and had proper education. But everyone lived paycheck to paycheck, making just enough to get by since it was impossible to earn money the honest way. This was life. And in the midst of all that, there was our family and their friends. My parents would, would host these parties or gatherings, really, and the house would be filled with their friends, music, laughter, and drinking and great young, young energy. What great times were those? There were such nice people, young, energetic, ambitious, and full of life, trying to live and swim in the communist bullshit agenda that was all around them. And they were still trying to have their young fun at the end of their 70s and early 80s. Each family had two kids, as if by some government limit. No more, no less. One boy, one girl. In 1980s Moscow, that was the way of life. This is what made living exciting. Looking forward to the next family of friends gathering at our parents' house. What I took away from these party nights, and from my family in general, was that your family and friends are more important than having money. Dimon, let's go to Brighton Beach! Brighton Beach was everything I despised about being Russian. It was a mecca of Russian immigrants who still thought they were living in 1980s. The minute you tell someone that you're saying, I'm from, I'm from Russia, they're like, oh, Brighton Beach! They all drove luxury cars, had vodka drinking sprees at birthday parties at tacky restaurants that had names like The National, Rasputin, and Imperial. Дорогая Розочка, поздравляю вас с вашим 90-летием и хочу вызвать вас на сцену. Not to mention the beach itself, where men resemble big, big sea lions that would occasionally let out a grunt at their wife. Uh, Розочка, подай еще один сэндвич. Роза, pass me another sandwich. Their wives were pushing 60, had grandkids, and were wearing G-strings. Letting it all hang out while they're crunching on sunflower seeds, wearing Gucci sunglasses and discussing the latest gossip. Right on beach! But the beach was free! That was the best part. I put some goggles on and Roman impulsively rolls into some random parking lot. To the right, I see three flags swaying in the wind. One Canadian, one British, and one Australian. Looking at these flags, Roman said to me in a serious tone, Let's steal those three flags. <laughs> I'm like, how? They're huge. They must be bolted to the floor. Nisette! I have a plan. <laughs> Here was his plan. I had to go to the store and ask the people for directions. Meanwhile, he would pull over and park his car with the open trunk blocking the flags. Then by his signal, we x down the flags and put them in the trunk. It was beaming at me. He was beaming at us with his hands. How do you like my plan? I said, this is a fucking crazy idea. Although looking at him, I saw he was totally serious. I said, fuck it, let's do it. I had one question, wait, wait, wait. But how are we gonna x them down? He said, I have an X in my car. <laughs> what? You're fucking lying. He went to the trunk and after searching for a while, I heard some crashes, some, some, some plastic things flying out. He whipped out this huge woodcutting, rustic looking X. I was in awe. He was an old time collector of random bullshit, that's for sure. But now, we had all the props. It was time to act. <laughs> I went to the store to ask for directions with wide open eyes, innocent eyes that was pretending to be a lost driver looking for the road to Florida. The police ended up not being the rest area but a travel agency. That's why there are flags, I realized. The travel agent lady politely explained to me how to get to Florida. I went outside and action. Everything happened according to the plan, as if we were thieves stealing a large rare diamond from a high security bank. I ran to the car and went to work with an ex. While he was holding the flags, I go, Goes Australian. 
We celebrated by opening fresh beers. <laughs> When we got to New Orleans, we decided to change for New Orleans. My outfit was a white curtain as a skirt, tucked in British flag, golf club, and a walking stick. Beads down to my knees, huge raver, dark sunglasses, and a hand in the cast, broken hand. That was my outfit. Roman's outfit was a long white Indian skirt with bright blue flowers, red bandana, green hat, small round little glasses, golf club, and a smile. We were ready for New Orleans. It was midnight. We were in the middle of it all. Crowds of people roaming the streets, drunken laughter. <laughs> <laughs> Loud men, loose women, neon lights, live music blasting from left and right, strip clubs, bars, advertisements for cheap shots, and even washboard solos. It felt like a carnival, even though there was no holiday going on. Since the beginning of time, the primal needs of our human existence ruled our senses. Here you felt like something ancient woke up inside and wanted out. The throbbing rhythm of life was eager to drown itself in the overindulgence. and this whole bunch of shit that happened there and then, and then we're just driving into Texas and as we're driving we're driving and driving and next big city is Houston driving down the American Dream Highway we saw ranchers and grasslands and free roaming cattle the cows were chewing on their grass building up fat to be slaughtered later sliced cooked and eaten in one of the fine country cooking restaurants that serve famous Angus beef burgers. The only thing that was missing was a bunch of Indians galloping after some buffaloes. <laughs> we had about 150 miles left to Houston. We were out of fuel, so we stopped at a gas station that looked like thousand other gas stations. After we filled up the car, we were goofing around with the apples we bought at the rest area supermarket. As we were eating them, we were throwing pits and leftovers at each other. And then uh, I, I noticed some Latin dude walking over to us. And when he started asking us for some change, I told him, we didn't have any. Which was true, since all the change we had, Roman gave to John back in Florida. Roman turned to him and said, hey, we got some apples though, you want some? He nodded, so Roman threw him an apple. So the Latin American guy started crunching away in their apple. He seemed really hungry. 
I turned to look at him closely. There's a Latin homeboy with a mullet, jean shirt, white tank top, and old white socks pulled all the way up. Roman asked him, so where are you going? He said, I'm going to Dallas. Oh, I got to do Latin thing. I'm going to Dallas to see my sister. Roman continued, how are you getting there? The guy replied, I'm walking. No. I said, what do you mean you're walking? On the highway? My eyes are half closed. The two red lights of the car in front of me slowly turn into the eyes of a snake. And I remember from the book I read somewhere, when you see a snake, you go into the next level of consciousness. I saw her rise from the white line of the road, and her head raised above the hood of the car to, to look back at me. It looked like Cobra with two red diamond eyes. She was staring directly into my eyes. Her eyes were hypnotizing me, and I slid into some parallel reality. My head fell on my shoulder, I closed my eyes, and when I opened them again, I saw in distance a lonely man descending from a sand dune, hurt by love, relationships, broken promises. He looked like a Native American walking with his head down. His clothes were made of yellow leather and ripped in a few places with patches of blood. He was following a snake, which was winding and unwinding in front of him, showing him the way. The snake's eyes were crystals that she used to illuminate the way. A short distance apart, Coyote was following them. She knew in the desert the sun burned everything that had water, and if Native American did not find his way out, she would get his bones to polish. All of a sudden, the desert snake stopped and crawled back to his feet, the Native American stopped and was staring at her, not sure what to do next. Winding and unwinding in rings, the snake started crawling up his leg. At first he was taken aback, but then he realized that's there to show him the way out, so he surrendered to whatever would come next. The snake clumped, climbed to his shoulders and whispered into his ear, There are powers that show us the great spirit that dwells within us all. You are a lost soul, and you have a lost connection to your body. I'm gonna show you a way back. I'm gonna show you a way back. She climbed back down to the ground and started winding and unwinding towards the car. The Native American followed her, and she, she climbed into the car, and then she whined into my neck, and she started kissing me. But instead of the lips, it was woman's lips. That was the end of the trip. Got back on the plane. I flew back. And there's only one thing I have to tell you before I get off the stage. I'm going to say my last closing chapter of the book. If you ever start pondering whether you should take a road trip, I would say yes. Because any road you choose is the same road. All roads lead to the same place. But everyone's way of getting there is different. The passengers and drivers that help us get there may change. But the most profound feeling we can share as people is traveling together. I closed my eyes and I was in the road and I had big brown ladies underwear. Why? You have to read the book. Thank you guys, get the book, it's only 10 bucks, I love you all, that was it, Yuri from Google Bartello, I'm going to be right there selling my drinks.